the results of the fall. Um, are there consequences to human actions? Are there consequences to human actions? What makes the difference between, a, say, a 16-year-old kid, and actually, let me use my son on this example. What, what, what's the difference between my son when he was 16 years old and when he's 22 years old? As a 16-year-old, did he think that he could do things in life and there would be no consequences? A young person does things and thinks, I can do it, I can get away with it, or there will be no consequences, or I can overcome the consequences. So at 16, he thought there were no consequences. In his case, he joined the Marines, much to his mother's chagrin and mine, and went off to Afghanistan. He's been to Iraq, he went to Afghanistan this time. Uh, one of his friends was shot dead, another one was shot through the neck his best good friend. Um, actually, he's on YouTube, actually. Hadley is on YouTube running. He gets shot through the neck, and he's got a patch on. He's running to a helicopter, and somebody put it on YouTube. And we said, my wife and I were there, hey, there's Hadley, you know? But uh, anyways, he, he survived that. He survived the shot through the neck. It missed his, uh, the artery coming down by like a millimeter, and, it, and if it had been a millimeter over, he would have been dead. But Question, my son, when he was 16, was he immortal? Could he do anything, and there would be no consequences? At 22, does he now know mo what mortality is, that he could die? Yeah. Does that change the way he looks at life? Does that change? Why? Act, consequence. Act, consequence. Actions are connected to consequence. Is that the difference between somebody that's 16 and now, in his case, 22? Although when I talk to him, sometimes I feel like I'm talking to an old man at 22. It's pretty pathetic. Okay, because he realizes he's seen so much of life, too much. Okay, so what I'm suggesting here is that, that this connection between act and consequence is really big in Scripture. By the way, we won't be doing, doing much with Proverbs, but if I were to summarize the whole book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is largely telling the young person in Proverbs, actions and character are connected with consequences. Actions and character. Character leads to consequences. And so, uh, but anyway, so we see this now. There's consequences. Adam and Eve sin, they're adults, and there are consequences. And what happens here is there's consequences between God and man. Man goes into hiding. Where does he hide? He hides in the bushes. And so God comes walking, called to them, where are you? And he answered, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Notice God, man's response to God now is one of fear. But you remember the fear of God is the what? Hmm. Now you say, well, but fear doesn't really mean fear. Oh, really? Is that true? And so we got to have a big discussion about what does it mean to fear God? That's coming. But notice here, man's afraid. He's hiding in there. And so what happens is it says basically, so I hid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man says, I did it. It was me. Don't blame her. It was me. I did it. Uh, it was wrong. Okay. I, I, I deserve to die, don't, she's, you know, don't blame her. <laughs> no, okay, this is the first man, he goes, and check this out, this is pretty pathetic. The man said, so God says, have you eaten the fruit? And he says, the, it was the, the woman, the woman that you put here, she gave me, and I ate, I ate of the tree, uh, she gave me from the tree and I ate it. So then what's God do? God says, okay, the woman. So he goes to the woman next, and the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman says, not me, not me, it was, a, it was a serpent. Okay, it was a serpent. So then God goes, serpent, okay, let's start with the serpent. So God kind of moves from the man to the woman to the serpent, and the serpent then gets uh, the first curse. Let me go back to finish this out, though. What you have now is a separation between God and his people. What you have now is a separation between God and his people. God with his people is this concept here. Do you know what this word means? Emmanuel. You see the word El on the end. El means what in Hebrew? God. Emmanuel means God with us. 
And what happens is God is with them in the garden, walking with them in the garden, talking with them. God is with his people. Now that they have sinned, there's a what? There's a separation. Human beings go into hiding. And so what happens is, what you're going to find in scripture now is that what? God now goes to absconditas. In other words, there's the hidden God now. Rather than the God that's with you in the garden, walking with you and talking with you, now God is hidden. God is hidden. Man hid from him. But by the way, does anybody remember, you guys read in um, Exodus, when do the people see God on the mountain and the mountain shaking at Mount Sinai? The people are what? Do they say, oh God, just show us yourself? Or do the people say, uh, that's enough, uh, like, uh, yeah, we back off, yeah. Okay, so God basically has gone into this absconditus. But by the way, what does the rest of scripture do? The separation between God and his people is the rest of scripture, does the rest of the Bible, from Genesis 1, 2, and 3, is the rest of the Bible telling us how God comes back to be with his people. And Jesus then, he shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And he is called what? Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. And then what? Jesus goes back. What is the spirit? Now the spirit dwells in us. And ultimately, does Christ come back and gather us to be with him? And so shall we be with the Lord for what? Forever. So ultimately, all of scripture, the separation, all of, it's, all of it's pointing forward to this time when human beings will come back to be with God. And God is working out the details of what happened in Genesis 3, what happened in Genesis 3, the rest of the Bible is this re great redemptive work of God by which God redeems his people. And he, he comes in the tabernacle. Where does he dwell? You say, Hildebrand, you skipped those ch tabernacle chapters, so we didn't read it. In the tabernacle, God is dwelling in the midst of his people. When Solomon builds a temple, what happens? The, the Shekinah glory cloud comes down and God dwells in the midst of his people. With Jesus, it actually happens. You have what? God in flesh now in the midst of his people. So the rest of scripture Scripture is going to be this God absconditus becoming Emmanuel, God with his people again, drawing us to ultimately, we what? Are we with God forever and ever? And that ultimately, does the Garden of Eden begin the Bible, but does the Garden of Eden end the Bible where we are back again into God's presence? Is that the great hope? Are Christians hopeful people? Oh, everything's going wrong in the world and this whole place is going to blow up and think. Now, question, are Christian people hopeful? Yes, because we look forward to a day when we will live with God forever, okay? And the Garden of Eden is revisited. So, okay, now, what else happens here? Human beings, are human beings affected from the sin? Well, we know that human beings die for the, what does the Bible say? There's some verse in the Bible that says, the wages of sin is death, okay? And so coming out of the sins of the garden, humankind die. But is it only humankind that has been affected by the fall into sin? The Bible says no, all of nature, all of creation, Romans 8.22 says all of creation groans. All of creation groans, waiting for the coming day of redemption. The creation itself groans, waiting for this great redemptive act of God to happen. How does the creation groan? You've got, what, famines, you've got tsunamis, you've got earthquakes, you've got plagues happening, you've got disease happening, you've got cancer, you've got all this bad stuff happening. The whole of creation is waiting for the coming day when things will be made right. But have some of you felt that in your own life, where you, you realize how messed up life is and there's a groaning in you, wait, just longing for things to be made right? that someday this thing's going to make sense and it's going to be right. All the things that are wrong are going to be made right. And you long for that. You groan for that. This is what this verse is talking about in Romans. All of creation groans, waiting for that coming day of redemption and stuff. It's a beautiful verse. Now, what happens to people well, as far as our bodies? The bodies go from, back, what? from the body back to dust. From dust you are to dust you shall return. And so there's a, there's a toll paid in the body. By the way, when Jesus raises from the dead, does Jesus raise just the spirit of Jesus raises from the dead? Or does Jesus raise body and all? Jesus raises body. Put your fingers in my hand. Put your fingers in my side. Jesus' body raised, which means does our body get raised? Yeah, we get raised from the dead. Body, all of us. Okay. So, man and woman. Okay. Conflict and blaming. Man starts blaming woman. Woman will start blaming man. Okay, but in this context, the man blaming the woman and things. Uh, is, is Adam a real stand-up guy? 
This guy blames his wife and stuff. That's a good move. I've done it many times. But anyways, uh, so so I, I don't fault the guy, you know. But just uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Anyways, all right.